Hey there, hi there, who there, everybody on YouTube. This is Dimensions in Time. You can just call me D. Let's take a look at Industrial Craft 2 Experimental Nuclear Power. How do you get started with nuclear power? Well, the very first thing that you're going to want to know is you have to have a hazmat suit on while handling nuclear materials. If you don't, you're going to be uh, irradiated, get radiation poisoning, and die. No way around it. So you need to have this suit on, and it consists of the scuba helmet, the hazmat suit, the leggings for the hazmat suit, and the rubber boots. This is your protection against radiation poisoning. Always be wearing this while you're handling radioactive material, and you'll be fine. Now, moving on to how you process uranium ore. You're going to find uranium ore in the ground all around your world. Dig it up. And I'm going to take you step by step through the process. Let's take a look at an illustration first, and then we'll go from machine to machine and see how these things work. When you find your, your uranium ore in the ground, you want to throw it into a mace raider, and that's going to give you crushed uranium ore. Now, what you can do is take that right into a thermal centrifuge to get your uranium out of it. But I like to wash mine first in an ore washing plant. That's going to give you a little bit more of your uranium, your crushed uranium, plus some lead dust. Now, the lead is going to come in handy later on when you want to build your reactor and a lot of the components for some of the bigger reactors that takes a lot of lead. So the more lead you have, the better. So you take your uranium, crushed uranium ore, and throw it into a thermal centrifuge, and that's going to give you uranium-235 and 238. In order to use this as a fuel in a nuclear reactor, you need to put it in something, and that's called the fuel rod. Now you can see here you take some iron ingots, throw it into a metal former to get some plates, throw those plates back in in extrusion mode, and that's going to give you your fuel rod. Once you get your fuel rods, you can enrich your uranium by taking three, three, and three. Three of the 238 across the top, three of the 235 across the middle, and then three more 238 across the bottom. That's your recipe for enriched uranium. And now in order to get that into the empty fuel rod, you need a fluid solid canning machine. So you throw both of those into the canning machine in canning mode, and that will create your fuel rod. Now there are different levels of the fuel rod. A single, a dual, and a quad. Each one of these has more power and there are crafting recipes. As you can see here, two plus an iron plate gives you the dual. Four and three iron plates and two copper plates give you the quad. Now we'll go over these recipes and how they work in just a second. So let's take a look and see how we go about getting the ore and processing it from machine to machine. So the first thing you need to do is once you get your ore out of the ground, and I've got some here, you need to throw it into a macerator. I'll throw that in there and we'll see. I've got all my machines have a overclocker upgrade so it goes pretty fast. So once you get crushed uranium ore, as I said, you can go right to your thermal centrifuge but I like to wash mine in a washing plant. Now back here I've got an infinite water source and some pressure pipes from the pressure pipes mod feeding water into my washing plant. I've got an MFSU back here feeding all my machines power just so you know how this little system's working. So you take your crushed uranium ore and you throw it into the washing plant and that will give you your purified crushed uranium and your, du your uh, lead dust which is which is really useful later on. Let's take a look at the thermal centrifuge and how this works. This is what you use to process your crushed uranium and turn it into uranium that you can use for fuel. Now if I throw crushed uranium in here, it's going to process here. And just so you know, this thermal centrifuge actually has a heat component to it. You have to heat it up first before you can use it. And I have a little lever on here uh, that keeps the heat at a constant level so that I don't have to heat it up every time. Otherwise, it's a tedious process. It has to heat up first, then go through the processing of it. It's a lot faster if you just keep it heated all the time so it's ready to use. 
So now I've, I've gone through and done the crushed uranium, and you can see that same stone dust that we washed away comes out when you, when you use it here. But also, I got four of the 238 and one of the 235. Not too bad. Now I've got a couple piles up there, but let's go through it again. It looks like this machine lost some heat there for some reason. But we'll go through and just go and use it anyway. So, there we go. Now it went back up. Let's throw the purified in here, and what you'll find is that you're going to get a little bit more of these than normal with purified, and that's because we've washed away that stone, but also because it's purified. So you get, it's a little bit better quality. Once it processes, you'll see exactly what happens. Almost done there, and there we go. So I got one more of each. Not too shabby for just running it through one machine. Plus I've got this added bonus of the lead. So once you get those two types of uranium, you need to make enriched uranium fuel. And this is where the crafting table comes in. You take your 238 and put three across the top and the bottom, and then take your 235 and put three across the middle, and that gives you your enriched uranium nuclear fuel that you can use in your reactors. You need something to put that fuel in, and that's where the metal former comes in. You take some iron, put this in rolling mode, and throw your iron in there, and that's going to make some plates. And once you get a few plates, switch this to extruding mode, and then put it in there, the plates in there, and you get your fuel rods. So once you've got a few fuel rods, and let me grab some of this. I've got a few enriched up here that I already made from that crafting table back there. Put your f uh, fluid solid canning machine into canning mode. Throw your enriched uranium in there and your fuel rods, and it will can it for you. Again, I've got the speed upgrade, so it goes by really fast. Now I've got fuel rods. This is the point where I'm going to absolutely need this, or else I'm going to be poisoned. Oops, just click. So, I've got my fuel rods. Let's pull them out of there. There are three different ways you can use these. The single mode, you can just throw one of these or a bunch of these singles in there, and you'll get some power. But you can make dual by taking two of these and an iron plate and fusing them together in the crafting table. Same thing for a quad. Okay. A couple of uh, copper plates, some iron plates and that's going to give you a quad. Different levels of energy for the three different levels of fuel. So how do we make our nuclear reactor? What you need to do is get some lead plates and a basic uh, machine casing and that's going to give you your reactor chamber. Three of those reactor chambers across surrounded by dense lead plates, which you uh, make by putting into the compressor, a generator, and an advanced circuit, and that's going to give you your nuclear reactor. Not too bad at all. Now, I could make a simple nuclear reactor by taking a few of these fuel rods and throwing it in here and turning this machine on, and it will make power. You can see it's putting out 100 EU per tick. But you can also see that the core temperature is rising on this thing. And without any kind of cooling, this will explode once it reaches 100%. So how will we get this to run with and give us power without exploding? That's a bad thing because these things explode very violently. Well, you've got a couple of different options. The first option is you can use any one of these coolant cells, and you can see there's 10K, 30K, and 60K. These will cool, uh, in relation to their name, 10,000 heat units, 30,000 heat units, 60,000 heat units. And then there's also a couple of condensators here that do a really good job. Um, and you can look up the different ways that these actually cool. Um, but just know that this is the lowest, and it goes all the way up to the highest. You can surround within the chamber, take one of these and surround it with those can those cooling cells and it will keep it cool. But once your core temperature goes up, 
these do not dissipate heat at all. They just keep heat contained. Uh, so they suck it up, but they will not blow it out. So, how do I get this core temperature down once it's actually gone up? Well, they have vents here that you can use, heat vents. You can take in heat, some heat vents and put them in uh, a configuration within your nuclear reactor to allow this to run and vent heat at the same time and keep the core temperature down. Now let's grab a couple of these heat vents, throw them in there, and you'll see the temperature starts to go down. These are venting heat. They suck up the heat and they vent it out. There are different ranges for these um, in, in how much heat they actually dissipate. Um, I'm not going to go over the numbers. You can look those up for yourself. Just know that it goes in order of lowest to highest as far as how much they do. These are also these also do different things too. Reactor heat vents will vent the heat, but they won't interact with surrounding. I believe uh, these will actually uh, react with surrounding ones, and then the component heat vent will actually help uh, other. Uh, components as well so this next to a heat vent will actually t this will actually take heat away from the overclocked it doesn't take it out of the reactor it actually helps to keep these cool so there are there are a lot online a lot of different configurations that you can use um, just go and look them up on uh, the forums and there's so many people have made so many different configurations that stay stable as far as making temperature stay stable uh, it's it's ridiculous how many different ways you can actually do it uh, and keep it efficient and also keep it cool now you've also got exchangers and that's to move heat around so one of these exchangers will actually grab heat from another uh, overclocked heat vent uh, you know or one of these other heat vents and move it and then dissipate it itself so a combination of all these things really help and then the plating here, not only does it redirect heat or absorb heat, but it also, uh, like the containment reactor, will keep uh, explosions if it happens to a minimum. So it reduces things. You know, I think it's 10%, 30%, something like that. Uh, but you've also got reflectors that will reflect power back onto the, the fuel rods to help increase the power output that it gives, but it also increases heat. So you've got to keep those in mind. So, there's a planning, uh, on the forums you can find a download for a Java program that will allow you to plan how to put these into a configuration, and I won't go over those here, You'll, you can experiment and find those yourself. Just know that I've got a couple of illustrations here that I'm going to show you. So, the simplest one that you could actually make is, you take one of these fuel rods, and one heat vent. Actually, let me grab it from over here. And that is the simplest one that you can make. As you can see, it only outputs 5 EU per tick, but keeps the core temperature down. This is venting heat constantly. This is making heat constantly. So it keeps it down. Now, there are some configurations that people make where the core temperature actually does slowly rise and put outputs a lot of power and then they put a, a redstone signal to take the place of this lever and they turn it on and off uh, over time using some kind of a processor, you know, time processor such as red power, blue power, something like that. So, that's the, how you make it. Let's take a look at a configuration. Uh, this is a reactor designed by Zombie that I found on the internet, and it's a stable one. It takes these overclocked heat vents, some heat exchangers, and component heat vents, six of the single fuel rods, and it creates stable power. The core temperature goes up to 1% and then basically stays around the same. And you'll see these component heat vents are pulling heat away from these, so these are heating up. As this goes down, that means that they're getting hot. Uh, the more heat it removes from the reactor, the lower this will be until finally it disappears, basically. So these will get abused unless you remove heat from them. As you can see, the exchanger is moving heat around. Pretty nifty little design. 
stays stable at 100 EU per tick and the temperature stays stable. Pretty neat. Now there's another design over here and this is the design by Rick. Also found this on the internet. And this uses quads. A little bit more power like we said. Also throws in some plating but stays very stable at 120 EU per tick. And you can see that nothing, nothing moves really. Very stable design. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how you can build these things. Watch your temperature. 100% means explode. So make sure that your temperature stays low. Now here's another design of a reactor and basically what you do here is you take your normal nuclear reactor and surround it on all sides by chambers. Well, what does this give you? A much larger area to work with to make more power. Pretty nifty, right? So I've got an MSFSU here. You can see that I've already run it before. Let's turn this puppy on. This is a design by Natesky9 that I found on the net. This is giving a stable output of 320 EU per tick. Not too bad. And you can see these component heat vents next to these overclocked heat vents. These are sucking heat away from the heat vents. The exchangers are moving heat around between these. Pretty nifty, huh? Core temperature stays stable at zero. And basically the only thing you're going to have to replace over time is the fuel rod. These fuel rods will go down over time. I like it. So let's take a look at this monstrosity over here. This over here is a different kind of reactor. It's what's known as a fluid heat reactor. It's made up of a 5x5 five five block of reactor pressure vessels and there's really no difference between this and this other than this casing outside. Inside here it's basically the same thing. The reactors in here in the middle with some space in between for the fluid to go in and what you'll see is this is actually the same thing but with fluid on either side and what you do is you feed it coolant on one side and on the other side it goes across these elements and on the other side it uh, has hot coolant that comes out there's a few different types of other blocks that you can put in there and I'll show you over here I've got it back here behind everything I've got this set up so you've got reactor pressure vessels that make up the outside you've got your reactor chambers and your nuclear reactor that are making your basic reactor shape then you've also got an access hatch which is what I clicked on to get the access to the reactor uh, the nuclear reactor itself you've also got a redstone port which allows you to turn it on and off and you've got fluid ports that allow f the coolant to go in and out of the reactor. What do you say? Let's build one. Just to illustrate exactly how it's made, I'm going to build one back here. So it's a 5x5 five five multi-block structure. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, or actually this counts as 1, 2, 3, 4, Five. There you go. Pretty simple to make. And then, again, I'm just illustrating here what it is that we're actually building. Now here's how I like to make this. I take my nuclear reactor and these chambers I put this block here in the middle, but I'm going to destroy it in a second, and here's why. You have to place down your reactor before you can place down your chambers. These won't go anywhere without a reactor to connect to. So you have to put your reactor up there first. Then I just get rid of that. Reactor chamber on 
all sides. Up top here too. Go back to my pressure vessels. Let's build this high. Five high. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. Now obviously I'm in creative here so you're not going to be able to fly around unless you have jetpacks or something. Do your best. I think you're probably starting to get the idea of how this is made and what I was talking about. 5x5 five five structure of its surrounding. Now the walls are empty right now. But let's say this is the front over here. Sounds like some kind of huge truck outside. I'm going to take a break. I'll be right back. Okay, truck gone. So I've left two spaces open here, and these are for my other blocks. The one that I want to put up top here is the redstone port, and that's what we're going to put a lever on. Let me grab a lever. in order to turn this on and off. The other port I want is an access hatch. Now that's going to give me access to the reactor inside. And then the only other port that you have to work with is this fluid port. Hello Mr. Sheep. You're always coming to visit me on these spotlights. Okay. Now what I like to do is I put my fluid ports on the very bottom reason being the fluid is going to sit in the bottom of this structure inside so this will give it access to it if it runs out if you put it up here and it doesn't reach I'm not sure it'll suck it out it might but I'm not sure never actually tried it so this back section I'm just gonna fill in all with that stuff and then same thing down here, fluid port, fill the rest in, Oop, not with access hatches, with the actual pressure vessels. Okay, that's my system. Now when I click this access hatch, if I've got it done right, and you can see I haven't filled in the top here, you should see the ports over here for fluid in and out. And I don't see that yet. Why? Because I didn't build the top. That was an oversight on my part. Don't blame the foreman. There we go. So now that the 5x5 five five structure is complete, you'll see that I've got the ports in there. And this basically is the same thing as a regular reactor. You could actually go inside here and click this. I don't recommend going in after you've already started the reactor the fluids gonna be hot in there and it could burn you so these reactors output heat units rather than EU you can't just take a wire and hook it up and expect to get heat uh, EU out of this it's not like one of your EU reactors this is a fluid reactor that accepts coolant or cold liquid and outputs hot liquid and then you take that hot liquid and use that hot liquid to create energy in some fashion and I'll show you how that's done same thing as any other reactor if it reaches 100% it will explode in a mucho violent uh, explosion so let's take a look at a design by a guy called Mementh and his video is on YouTube here uh, I've got a link at the bottom that you can click on to see his video. And this is the uh, configuration internally that's pretty stable to create uh, energy, or I'm sorry, heat units, not energy, and keep the core temperature down. You can see over here I've already filled it with hot co or with cold coolant. Hot coolant on this side will be uh, ejected from the ejectors oh that is one thing that I forgot to tell you on your fluid ports on the side of your system over here you're going to have reactor fl uh, 
fluid ports, you're going to have a uh, place for an ejector. The ejector module allows it to eject the hot liquid out of the hot side. There's an intake and an outtake or an output. The output sends out the hot liquid, the intake pulls in the cool liquid. These blocks will actually do both at the same time if you want them to eject the hot using an ejector. Now if you take this ejector out of here, it will actually only be an input. So you could technically have an ejector on one side and an intake on the other and have the fluid going through. But these reactors heat up so much that you really need to have both sides pulling and pushing basically at some point once you get to a bigger reactor so or uh, more heat units produced once you get to a certain number of heat units produced this hot coolant won't be pulled out fast enough to cool this down you'll see let's take a look at his design here basically what's happening is I've got if you look behind these machines I've got an ejector port behind this heat exchanger and this one uh, it's an ejector and an intake a fluid port what it's doing is, is it's going to pull the hot liquid out of the reactor, run it across these conductors, and turn it into cool liquid, which will then be ejected, because I have an ejector upgrade in here, out. Okay? And basically, it's just going to pull, push, pull, push. It's constantly going to be pulling and pushing hot coolant in and out and turning it into cool coolant. Now, these liquid heat exchangers actually are a heat block. And actually, let me grab one and show you. You can see the little bronze thing there. I've got another video online that shows this these heat components. What happens is when this come when the hot coolant is pulled in and it goes across these uh, the conductors that when you put them in there and turns it into cool um, coolant these heat and these heat exchangers will heat this element here and anything that's on the other side that lines up with it and I don't have them connecting but I'm just showing you any any element that touches this element is going to be exchanging the heat that's why they call it a liquid heat exchanger so if you have two of them side by side this one would pass the heat to this one the way that the system works is it both of these liquid heat exchangers are pointed toward this steam generator. Now the steam generator will uh, accept heat from both units and heat up these elements. And then I've got distilled water going into these to create steam. Normally when you put a liquid heat exchanger next to a steam generator, it just creates steam. When you put one on either side of it, it gets twice the heat going in. And if you set it to this optimal setting, 221 uh, for the output, and then the water at one megabyte, uh, meg, uh, excuse me, micro bucket per tick. <laughs> I think it's micro, it might be milla, I'm not sure. But micro bucket per tick. Uh, it's going to pull one uh, tenth of a bucket in and turn it into steam and since two of these are heat superheating it it will turn it into superheated steam so normally if you have one on it it turns it into steam but two makes superheated steam the steam gets fed from this machine down to a kinetic steam generator now a kinetic steam generator turns a turbine in the middle here and that produces kinetic energy which then you have a kinetic generator attached to that that turns that into EU so that's how you're powering hot fluid in hot fluid in pushing into the steam generator which turns it into steam that gets pushed into this machine which turns a turbine inside that in turn turns another turbine on the the other side of this and they have to be lined up, and I'll show that too. And that makes heat. Now, once this superheated steam gets used here, it turns into regular steam, which we can do another kin kinetic steam generator, which has another turbine that turns, 
which turns this kinetic generator and that actually produces another set of energy. Superheated steam turns this so fast that it creates 100 EU per tick. Let's turn it back today. And then this takes regular steam and, uh, and turns it and produces 50 EU per tick. So basically steam is running down this way. At the very end, it gets the condenser, which then turns it back into distilled water. Now, the distilled water is collected here. The steam is collected here, turned into distilled water. And then it goes down into these fluid regulators. And I, and I have these regulators set up so that it pushes the fluid back up into the machine here. So it's a closed system right here that's basically circulating distilled water and turning it into steam. Why distilled water? Because in this steam generator, distilled water does not calcify. If you've just fed regular water into this machine, it would calcify if you've ever used the steam generator. Calcification builds up to the point where the machine doesn't work. Well, what is calcification? It's basically the same as the real world, um, regular water has minerals in it and, you know, metals and things like that that will stick to these elements and cause them not to work. So at a certain percentage of calcification, this thing's not going to heat up anymore, which is not going to make steam, which is just going to send water going through here and it's never going to work. Once this kinetic steam generator fills up with water, this won't turn and it does not work. And you'll actually see a message that says blocked. Now, about these two machines, kinetic steam generator and kinetic generator. Let's take a look here. Let me grab one of each. There is the steam generator and there is the kinetic generator. Now, the steam generator, if you lay it down, accepts the steam this way and turns a turbine in here. You saw we had the turbine in there. Let me grab a turbine too so I can show you. And now it's on standby mode. And you'll see this little thing come up and says condensation will slow it down. Any liquid that gets in here is going to slow this down. So you want the liquid out of there. And then the, the, you know, the steam that is turning this is ejected out this way. And it is getting lower in temperature as it goes out. So this is the turbine that turns. And then on the kinetic generator, there is another turbine. And I'll lay one down this way. And you'll see these two line up, just like the heat elements. These two have to line up in order for it to work. So if you, if you lay it down this way, they will line up. And you can see that that's the outer side because inside has that little dot on it. That needs to connect to the other machine. If you lay it down the wrong way, it's pretty easy to fix. You just need an IC2 wrench and basically sneak, click, and it turns it around. Sneak, click will always turn that machine around. Okay? So that's basically how that system works. When it's turning it, these two are connected. This is accepting steam, turning a turbine, which, oh, I've got two of the same thing, sorry. Connected together, which in turn turns this. So I need to line it up. But once again, these two need to line up. Once they're lined up and this is actually turning, you'll see a little lightning bolt here to show that it's producing energy. Pretty straightforward, pretty nifty system. Now up here, same exact thing, except the fluid regulators are across the top. So, now I've got these powered separately, and I'll explain what that means in a sec here. Because I want to show you what he has up here. This is a little bit different than I probably would have done it, but... Up here he's got a little, little bit different system. It's basically the same thing. It's pulling the heat out of this, going to a fluid regulator, and pushing it back up. And then up here, rather than taking the heat, liquid heat exchanger and putting it into steam, we're actually putting it onto a Stirling engine. 
and basically pulling out and pushing liquid heat and turning it directly into energy. Okay. So you can see these are all wired up. These are the kinetic generators they're going to turn. They're all wired up for power. This is the power that the system is generating. We want to keep that separate from the power that is powering the machines that need power. The only machines that need power in this setup are the condenser, and you'll see it needs power, and these fluid regulators. The fluid system of pumping, turning it back into fluid and pumping it back into the steam generator, they all need power. So we keep them separate from the power that's generated by the reactor, only because if the reactor ever goes down and these systems don't work, we could have an explosion. Hot fluid is still going to be fed from these ports inside of here if the power goes down into these steam generators which potentially could explode if it gets too much liquid in there. So the way that this is wired so that the fluid system is wired to my MFSU here, the power that is produced by the system is fed into this MS MFSU, which in turn powers these. Why? Because this can still run these liquid machines even if these aren't generating power for some reason. Let's say the turbines go bad, and they will, so you'll have to replace them. At some point, these will deteriorate, and you've got to replace them. You can automate that if you want. But if these aren't turning, it's not creating power, and if it's not creating power, these aren't running if you have it wired directly. So I've got them wired separately. That's how that works. So let's take a look at it running. As you can see, I see two coolant being fed in. It's outputting heat units, not power. And you can see over here, the IC2 coolant is starting to come out of there as hot coolant. Now those flashes that you're seeing are superheated steam being generated. And you can see the lightning bolts there. The system will even out so that steam doesn't keep getting generated. Basically what's happening here is that the system's not primed to work right. So coolant is not, or the, uh, the water is not actually being fed in correctly. And I could prime this system if I wanted to. But you can see that these are generating power. Now once the system gets up to power, this will be 100 and this will be 50. but they are producing power at this point. Here we're almost there. 100 EU per tick, 50 EU per tick. It's a pretty ingenious little system, and it's pretty stable. Core temperature staying down, and it gives you... When it's running fully, it'll give you that 1120 per tick all the time. I probably would have to turn off one of the machines and let it get primed first. So I'm going to turn it all off and you'll see what I mean by the separate power. System's not running anymore. None of these are producing power, or at least they shouldn't be. You can see now that they're going out. And what would happen is the hot liquid that's coming in to these over here basically could result in an explosion. So we want to avoid that. So let's take a look at another type of system like that. That's pretty neat, right? This one is made by a girl named Chloe. Her She goes by Mystery Dump. She, ha she uses the pressure pipes and her own little design, which I've enhanced a little bit here, in order to get power out of her machines. So I'm using the same configuration as the other one, just because this is the one that I liked that seems to work pretty well. Quad fuel rods and, and uh, this configuration right here. Coolant coming in, hot coolant going out. The difference being, I've got two ports on this side, 
pooling coolant and putting it into a uh, pressure pipes tank, which will allow me to store hot coolant to be processed even after the machine is, is turned off. That coolant is fed down through underneath and over to this pressure pipe, which feeds it into these liquid heat exchangers in the front. Basically, this is the same setup. It's just configured differently. It's uh, set up a little bit differently. Okay. Steam generator between two liquid heat exchangers. Why? Two rather than just one. Because we want that superheated steam. Same exact configuration. Kinetic steam generator. Kinetic steam generator. Superheated steam being fed into a kinetic steam generator and then that turns it into regular steam. Regular steam being fed into the other kinetic. Uh, coolant is being pumped in to the hot going across here, becoming cool, and then being pulled out of the side. And basically I got it going into a pressure pipe, which brings it over to this tank that's filled with coolant to feed into our nuclear plant. Now you can see here that I've got an access port on the back of this one too. You can put as many of these access ports in as you want. Um, you don't want to put, it has to be um, a bunch of these pressure vessels basically. You can't take the whole thing and make it out of access hatches because that would be silly. So you need pressure vessels. Uh, one per side is I think probably the rule. I'm not exactly sure. I've never tried to put more than one, but I always put one on the front, one on the back, just in case I'm working back here and I need to be able to look at it real close. Or real quickly, I should say. So let's get, get back to this. Um, so we've got the superheated steam going into steam and then coming to the last kinetic steam generator as regular steam. Then it's fed into the condenser going sideways rather than making a straight line. Okay, that turns the steam into regular uh, distilled water again. And then in Chloe's design, what she uses is a fluid distributor, which you put into concentrate mode. And that basically has all the sides sucking in water except for one output. So... The condenser here is going to push water, or this actually block is going to pull the water out of the condenser. Same thing above. I've basically got the same system, but just above it too. They suck water this way. They suck water this way. And then it gets output here. Or inputted here. Uh, yeah, output here. And then down into my system over here. And I've got a distilled water drum. This is her... Uh, storage unit for distilled water of choice that actually has a thing that'll pump it back into the system here okay so distilled water going into the steam generator here being pulled from the machines back into it over here pretty easy format to follow um, you'll you'll see basic machine casings around here I kind of like the idea that she d did where uh, it looks more industrial um, rather than actually looking, you know, like a monstrosity over here of having all these machines attached to the thing. I like the idea of pulling the liquid out and going into a tank before it's processed and then getting put back into a tank before it's shoved back in over here. I like that. Pretty neat. The only thing that I've done here that's different than hers is I've gone up another level. So as you can see, over here you've got two different systems on the one side. Over here you've got two different systems per level. And then I just separated them with some basic machine casings. So again, superheated steam pulled down liquid going this way. Now these steam generators are feeding those kinetic generators over here which in turn is sending the power 
down to my MFSU. And notice that I've got this separated again, and the, I've used different colored cables so that you can see the difference between which is wired to generate power and which is wired to use power. So all these liquid machines take the power in, that's our gold cable, all of these machines produce power and push it out, that's the glass fiber cable. Okay, quick cleaning of my inventory, and I want to show you something pretty neat. This is called Power Converters. It's a mod that's available online. And it allows you to take EU or RF or Steam or a couple other different things and convert it to regular power. And I want to show you, using this system, how cool it is to be able to take EU and convert it to RF from your nuclear reactor. So I've laid down an MFSU that's empty, and I've got a redstone energy cell here. I'm going to lay down that's also empty. I'm going to set that side to charge, and let's turn our nuclear reactor on. And you'll see here, oop, sorry about that, I wanted to click this, making sure it's daytime. You'll see here, starting to run. You'll also see over here that all of our turb all of our steam generators are running. Over here, superheated steam being created. That's that flash that you see. Once the system gets up to speed, those flashes will stop. You can see here that it's creating that superheated steam going backwards and turning these turbines, which is powering these kinetic generators. And you can see that they're all creating power now. At the very tippy top, I've done the same thing that Memeth did in his, where I just have a liquid ex uh, heat exchanger connected to a Sterling generator that's taking that heat and making power straight out of it. I've got three of those across. Each one of these is making uh, 50 EU, so that's 100 EU. So. All those are turning now. I think we're starting to get primed. We'll probably stop seeing that superheated steam pretty soon. The system will be working flawlessly in a second. We're generating power. You can see right there, generating power. Now that power is actually being fed across the, the energy bridge here. EU, energy bridge, RF producer. And see that this is consumer and this is a producer. And that power is being fed in to our energy cell. We're creating RF using EU. Pretty darn neat. Now, probably what you want to do is regulate this. Because as you could see, all of my power is being pulled from the system by it and being converted into RF. So a regulator right here, maybe a timer with a... a uh, with a, a, a ticking timer would that you know makes this activate only certain times um, would probably be helpful or get that system primed so that it's creating power that's stored and get enough stored in there so it'll power all your machines that are hooked up to this then start creating your RF that you need pretty nifty though right once again, hot coolant being pulled out of the system and stored in this tank. Now, my system here with all these machines is pulling this out at a rate where it's really not keeping any of this hot coolant in here. It's processing it as soon as it's made. And then over here, we've got cool coolant being pumped back into this, and it stays pretty steady and pushed into here. The reason I have so much coolant in here... Oh, I forgot to show you my little system back here. The reason that I have so much coolant in that tank is because I want coolant to be fed into that at all times. So back here in my little test world here, I've got an infinite water source being pumped into a steam generator. That steam generator, even though it's turned off right now, is creating distilled water. That distilled water is being fed into a canning machine with lapis lazuli, and that is creating my coolant, which I've got stored in a tank over here. At any time that I need to, 
I can take this intake over here and hook up a pressure intake, feed this over there, and feed this coolant into that tank whenever I need to. Now I've, I've, I've also got uh, fluid cells set up so that I can take fluid cells and fill them with the coolant from here and create universal fluid cells. And then what I can do is, if I need to, this is how I primed this system over here. You just throw these up here and it'll feed the coolant into your system. Now, my system's primed and filled already, so it doesn't need this coolant. It's constantly being pulled in from the fluid port in the back here. But that's a good way to get started. Start making your distilled water first, then start making, once you get a tank full of that or a, a, a barrel full of that or whatever, uh, what is that called? A drum. Once you get a drum filled with distilled water, then take the excess of that and start making coolant. And what you'll find is, early game, by the time you get enough distilled water and enough coolant to be able to fill these up as you're mining and getting all these resources to make these things, you'll be ready. To, you'll be ready to be able to feed coolant into this and feed distilled water into your power systems. Now you can see that there's there's basically no loss with this system anymore. There's no steam. Superheated steam is not being created and then, you know, bumped off or anything. The system is constantly creating superheated steam because it's got enough heat from that the reactor and it's being fed in and it's a pretty pretty stable system. One of the best that I think I've ever made. Core temperature staying at zero, constant right around a thousand being pumped out at a time of this so basically with this system the only thing that you really need to worry about is keeping this keeping these quads in here and you can automate that process and keeping cool liquid going into the system so that it does not overheat if I were to break one of these and not have enough coolant go in here, this hot coolant would start to rise. This tank would start to fill with hot coolant. This tank would start to empty of cool coolant. And very soon you're gonna to start to have core temperature rise, 100% explosion. Do not want that. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helps you out. Uh, it took me a long time to try to figure out exactly what was going on with this. If you like this video, please click like at the bottom, and I urge you to subscribe so that you can see new videos when they come out. I know I don't make them on a regular basis, but I hope they do help you, and I thank you a lot for watching.